and I notice a kid in the back seat, about 14, by himself, and I notice a kid in the passenger seat, about 14, and what do I notice? An adult male with gray hair. That is not unusual for children to falsely deny being abused. There are all sorts of reasons for it. Yeah, Jim, that's the thing with me. It actually creates compliant victimization, and it's a situation that makes it much more difficult for law enforcement officers because you would expect that if a kid is being sexually molested, they're going to they're gonna cry out. Hello, and welcome to Best Case, Worst Case. This is your host, Jim Clemente, former New York City prosecutor, retired FBI profiler, and writer-producer on CBS's Criminal Minds, and also co-creator of the new Discovery series, Manhunt Unabomber. And with me today is... Hi, Jim. It's Francie Hakes. I'm your co-host, former state and federal prosecutor. It's nice to be with you. And just so our listeners know, we're remote today. So in case they hear a little bit different sound, it's because all of us, including our guests, are in different locations. That's great. And speaking of guests, we have with us my longtime friend and colleague, Jim Fitzgerald, uh, talking to you from the Jersey Shore. Great to be back with you guys. Uh, Great. It's great to have you, Jim. So listen, Jim, we have had an opportunity to talk to you about your best case. And Today, we'd like to hear from you what your worst case is that you want to pick out from your career, your long career in law enforcement. You were a cop first, and then an FBI agent, and then an FBI profiler. So what kind of case do you have to tell us about today? Jim, I'm going to go uh, back in, uh, in time a bit here, even before my FBI career. And as I recounted in my book, A Journey to the Center of the Mind, book two, um, as a de- brand new detective sergeant, um, I got myself involved in a uh, case of a Roman Catholic priest who was abusing young boys. And it's one of the rare type cases I actually eyewitnessed the crime itself. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. And it's the worst case because, of course, the crime itself, but also the outcome wasn't exactly what I wanted or what probably society wanted. This is back in the early 1980s. So I'll be discussing that today at length. And uh, I know you guys will have some questions. And Jim, I know you still involve yourself in crimes against children. And uh, I know you'll appreciate this in, in, in our own sort of, uh, you know, uh, sad way here. Well, Fitz, one of the things that I'd like to ask, because, of course, as you know, I'm a former state and federal prosecutor and did crimes against children on on both sides. Um, I first should first tell our listeners that we're we're dealing with two Jims here today. So we're going to call Jim Clemente Jim and Jim Fitzgerald Fitz just to be a little bit easier so no one's confused. But Fitz, this is interesting to me that this is uh, an early case in your career. And the thing that I found a little bit shocking that you just talked about was having witnessed the crime. So let's go back to sort of the beginning of the case. How did you, where were you situated that the case came into you? What were you what was your assignment and how did you get the case? Well, all good questions, Francie. And uh, the bottom line is I was a police officer in Ben Salem Township, Pennsylvania. That's a northern suburb of Philly. Uh, A large, smaller department, we say, about 100 sworn back then. Uh, The Pennsylvania Turnpike, I-95, Route 1, all intersect there. And, um, you know, lots of stuff going on. I was a police officer there probably about six years at this point. It was 1982. And uh, for a few years before that, I was a plainclothes officer with long hair and denim jackets. And, uh, you know, I had uh, infiltrated all kinds of uh, different uh, neighborhoods and groups doing things. So now all of a sudden, I'm promoted to sergeant. I'm detective sergeant. I'm kind of in a suit and tie. And one night around 1030, I had to go out and interview somebody on a, a theft case at the local hotel. Uh, on uh, Route 1 in Ben Salem Township, just north of the Philadelphia border. And I did my interview, very routine, no big deal there. And I said, oh, I'm going to go back to my old plane clothes days. I have another hour and a half to my uh, end of my shift. So I circled the parking lot of the Hilton a few times. And just so to explain people, there used to be a a drive-in theater directly next to this hotel. It was called the Lincoln Drive-In. And many of our listeners may be old enough to have actually gone to regular drive-in movies. And they were G-rated, PG, maybe a few R-rated movies. Well, as the drive-in theater business was sort of collapsing and going away, Lo and behold, this theater started showing X-rated movies. And what we would find sometimes was people sitting in the Hilton Hotel parking lot. They push through the fence and they would watch the movies through the fence. Of course, you don't really need sound, I guess, watching pornography. So that's what they would do. And while I was cruising around this parking lot, I saw something very unusual and I took some actions. You probably want to hear about that, don't you? I absolutely do. I'm transfixed at the idea that a drive-in was showing rated X movies to start with, but it sounds to me like you were really uh, aggressively policing the area, and I love hearing about that. So I definitely want to know what you saw that drew your attention. That wasn't, by the way, drive-in porn. Uh, correct. It, uh, but um, it, it certainly was, you know, triple X-rated movie. They had to build their walls higher at the time, but somehow the dividing line between this hotel and the drive-in theater, people would somehow kick out a few slats of the wood, uh, you know, the wooden fence. And anyway, so uh, just to be clear to your listeners, yeah, I was not there for that reason. I had a legitimate interview inside the hotel about a theft case. So I go around once in the parking lot in my unmarked car. Remember, I'm in a suit and tie. I'm kind of dressed up now. And I notice a car. It's a summertime. And I notice a car with the windows smoked. And I said, no, that's kind of strange. But, you know, whatever. I know people come. I don't really care if people are watching. There's more important crimes in my town than someone sitting and watching, you know, a free movie and from one lot to the other. But I go around a second time and I see a head kind of bounce up and down. And then I see a smaller head in the back seat as my headlights are passing by this car. 
well, that's kind of weird. Uh, the people in the front seat and people in the back seat, something's not right here. So I pull my plainclothes car, my unmarked car, I should say, I'm in plainclothes, about three slots away, and I have my uh, walkie-talkie with me, my flashlight, and I, I, I know where the, for my plainclothes days, there's blind spots that cars have behind them where you can't really see in the mirrors. So I kind of do a funny little angle or two, then come around, and I walk right up to the driver's side window, and I notice a kid in the back seat, about 14, by himself, and I notice a kid in the passenger seat, about 14. And what do I notice? An adult male with gray hair with his face in the young boy's lap. And I'll just keep it at that for now. Yeah, I think that's probably descriptive enough. I, I think that's one of the things that Jim and I are trying to do with this podcast that we've had feedback on from our listeners on Twitter and our Facebook page that they like is that we're taking them inside or behind police lines in a way that they haven't heard before. And so I think one of the interesting things to talk about with you on this uh, particular case is what must have been your instincts, your training. Can you describe a little bit more what it was about what you saw that made you think, you know, I'm getting out of the car and I'm checking this out. I think that's not necessarily something the rest of us would have thought of. Well, and you're right. And instincts and experience uh, definitely played a role here. And uh, I, I have known lovers do, and, you know, teenagers or maybe, you know, even 20s, maybe people having an affair with one another. If they're of, you know, consenting age and there's no drugs or no one's, of course, being uh, compelled to do something, it's usually, all right, get out of here, you know, private property, whatever the deal is. But there was just something about a head sitting up by itself in the back seat, and I'm telling you, as the headlights, my headlights spun around, and just you know a few second, you know, left to right glimpse of these uh, of these images, uh, and then a, a larger head, sort of from the driver's side going down. I said the, the numbers are not right here. There, there's something wrong. Uh, if they are adults, I don't really care. Just get out of here. But this the smaller head it just seemed like I may have someone here younger than they should be looking at a movie like this, number one, and also being involved in something perhaps they shouldn't be involved in. So that's when my instincts took over. And my instincts always told me, put the flashlight under my right arm, the walkie-talkie in my right hand. And since I'm a lefty, as is our good friend Jim Clemente, um, I, you know, I keep my hand, I didn't have my gun out, but I, I had my jacket pulled back a little bit and I'm ready to pull it out. Whenever you walk up to a car, the person's in the car, they know what they've done, either guilty, innocent, or somewhere in the middle. A police officer never knows what he or she is going to get when they walk up. So you've got to be ready. And I'm not saying you have to have your gun out and pointed, but you should be ready to have it out within a second or two, just in case. And well, that's and that, that seems like that's one of the most dangerous times for police officers. I mean, just this week, we hear of a police officer responding to the scene of an accident who was shot and killed, by, allegedly anyway, by the person inside the overturned vehicle. So I can certainly see that your training teaches you to be prepared for anything, but I can't believe you were quite prepared to see a child sex abuse crime in progress. Well, I was. And just and just to go back uh, a second or two here, I did call the, it wasn't technically a car stop, but I called out the suspicious vehicle on the radio and I let the dispatcher know, here's the tag in the in the parking lot of this hotel and I'll be you know checking it out. So that was fine, 10-4. So now I'm recording on the airwaves. I knew one of uh, the patrol officers would be coming over. And sure enough, I walk up to the car and all the windows are steamed up and uh, uh, I shine the light right in. This guy's head comes up and the boy in the passenger seat is sort of juggling with his belt buckle and his zipper. And I'm saying, this is strange because this guy is definitely in his 50s. And the two boys I could see were early teens, you know, 13 to 15, somewhere in that age bracket. And finally, um, he puts, I knock on the window, he puts it down. And I'm trying to keep eyes on everybody's hands, but you still know what you have in a car. It's a full-size sedan, by the way. And, um, and next thing I know, uh, yeah, um, Sergeant Fitzgerald, Ben Salem PD, because I'm in plain clothes, don't forget. And uh, yeah, yeah, yes, officer, can I help you? I said, well, you can. You can tell me what you're doing here. Oh, yeah, we just uh, pulled over and, uh, and, uh, and just stopped here for a minute. You know, coincidentally, right in front of the, some missing slats that they could look right through at their angle and see, uh, you know, the triple X movie on the screen. Showing very clearly that people are willing to lie to police even when they have absolutely no idea what they should be saying. Exactly. And the lies continued, Francie. And the next thing you know is uh, I said, uh, may I ask you, what were you doing when I first walked up here? Oh, yeah, I dropped some change on the floor and I was trying to get it up. Oh, Fitz. And I'm not sure how he actually meant to get it up. But I then said to the young boy, I said, and what were you doing when I first? Oh, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I was just tucking my shirt in. Of course, he was lying. He, was, he didn't know what to do. And then I knew at this point, I mean, within seconds, these kids aren't the bad guys. I knew we had one or more victims here. So I wasn't trying to you know, jump on them, and, but I still wanted to know what the heck was going on inside the car. And I said, all right, you know what? Um, I opened the car on the, do the guy. The door was already open or unlocked. And I said, everybody get out. And uh, they get out of the car, and I get on my, my walkie-talkie and said, can I have some backup over here at the uh, hotel parking lot? And they came over. And I said, so can you tell me more? What, nothing, we're just friends. And I said, all right, can I see your ID? Long story short, I knew that there was a sex crime involved here at some level, one or more. And I knew this adult, clearly a guy over 50, clearly kids under 18. I got uh, three separate patrol, no, two separate patrol cars. Each of them took the kids into the police station. I told them, they're not under arrest. You're coming to the police station. We have to talk to you. Okay. And- uh, Fitz, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I have a couple of uh, questions. 
or at least points to make. It's so interesting and so typical, and I know Jim agrees with me on this, for there to be false denials in this situation. And that's exactly what you had here. And I think that's something that's so important for our listeners to understand is that you literally saw a sex crime happen and the child to whom this crime is being perpetrated upon denied it at least the first time to your face. And I I think it's really important to make the point that that is not unusual for children to falsely deny being abused. There are all sorts of reasons for it. And I suspect you're going to tell us about some relationship that was going on between the two, or at minimum, both those boys felt like they were going to be in trouble because that is what happens with child victims of sexual abuse. They believe they are going to be in trouble. You're a police officer. It's actually, if you think about it, kind of a child's, well, maybe not worst nightmare, but it is a nightmare. They're being sexually assaulted and the police show up. Most people say, oh, great, the police have come to rescue me. But child abuse is much more complicated than that. And I can understand why a child may have thought to himself, I'm about to get into trouble because I was doing something wrong. Uh, you're absolutely right. And of course, I know you've talked about this in other episodes, but the concept of grooming plays in here. And I, I knew right away this wasn't a stranger abduction or or you know, two boys kidnapped by this older man. They were, you know, they weren't handcuffed, they weren't tied. There was like there may have been like food wrappers, like you know, fast food wrappers, and then all of a sudden you're right, and this kid's telling me a lie. The guy's telling me a lie. The kid in the back seat, he's quiet so far. Uh, uh, and, and I think I get their names out of them real quick, and I don't even think I got the driver's name yet. Um, but uh, but you're right, and the lies didn't stop right there, um, but because I did learn there was some grooming on the part of this older yeah. person to these young boys. Yeah, Jim, that's the thing with grooming. It actually creates compliant victimization, and it's a situation that makes it much more difficult for law enforcement officers because you would expect that if a kid is being sexually molested, they're going to they're gonna cry out. But in fact, that's the opposite of what happens. Only a tiny percentage of kids actually cry out or complain or disclose when they're in the process of being groomed into a sexual victimization situation. And it's, it's really an insidious crime because of that. You're, you're absolutely right, Jim, and, and I'm not going to claim in 1982 I was an expert in, in this particular field, and if even the term grooming was used back then, but I realized this guy had some level of control over these two boys, and they were all lying to me at the same time, at least at first, at the scene of the original uh, suspicious car stop. Uh, what else happened at the scene, Fitz? You were talking about that the car itself uh, would normally potentially be left there if it was out of the stream of traffic. Did that become a key piece of evidence? Yes, the two different patrol cars took the two boys back. Uh, they weren't even handcuffed and they were searched with the choice do because they, we didn't think they committed any crimes. But so they went back to the police station. I stayed there with the individual and I'm, I had them in handcuffs. I knew something went down here and I read them his rights real quick. And, uh, and I'm just about to leave the car there and I just go, I just walk around from a different angle, the other side of the car with my flashlight and in plain view, what do I see but uh, several um, um, adult magazines, I see a vibrator and I see lubricating gel. And I say, okay, this now confirms what the heck is going on here. This car itself is even more of a crime scene than I thought it was. Now there's not only probably grooming, whether I use that term or not, but he has props and toys to, in fact, do what he wants to do with these kids. So uh, I called, uh, he's still in cuffs. He goes in the back of my car, and I call the duty tow truck, and they go and tow it in because we're going to do a full search on this car once we get back there. And we did find some other interesting stuff in the car, too. So well, Fitz, uh, that's, like a, that's like a sexual assault kit. I mean, we, we might call that a rape kit where he's got – everything he needs to perpetrate sexual assault on these boys. And as Jim and I have talked about a million times with respect to grooming, using pornography, the adult magazines, the movie that they were sneaking in, using those things to ensure a victim's compliance, but also their later silence because they now know that, or they feel that they are complicit in doing something wrong is virtually guaranteed to keep them silent. And what's incredible to me about this tale, and I can't wait to hear how it turns out, is that it's almost got everything about sexual assault that we talk about. Well, it does. And I mean, uh, there were no handcuffs or rope found. So again, it goes back to the grooming aspect, the, uh, uh, you know, almost talking the kids into doing these things, as well as instilling fear in them, where the the handcuffs or the rope or the binding material was actually more verbal and mental than actually needing physical tools to do that. So uh, and that was certainly reinforced as a as the evening went on. So so now we're about, you know, we're about 1130 at night and um, everybody gets back to the police station. I enlisted a detective that was working for me. His name's Terry Lockman. And the two of us wound up uh, interviewing the first boy uh, in, a, in, a, in a holding area. He wasn't handcuffed or anything. So we'll, we'll let you call your parents. And in Pennsylvania, I'm sure in most states, you really have to have a, a an adult or a guardian present to interview uh, a suspect of a crime if he or she's under 18. But he wasn't, these kids weren't, you know, suspicious of any uh Uh, being, you know, being charged with any crimes or being criminals themselves. So we did talk to them real quick. And the conversations, even though done independently, sort of came out the same. The first 10 minutes were denying everything. And then finally, they admitted that uh, this this individual by the name of Robert Hermley, they gave us the name first, uh, did in fact, uh, 
perform sexual acts upon them. Each of them, actually, he took turns. And before too long, we were saying, well, where did you, where do we even know this guy? Well, my parents know him. We know him from our school. Okay, your school and well, anywhere else? Well, our church, your church, yes. And then finally, they, the first kid told us, yes, he's, uh, he's Father Robert Hermley. He's a Roman Catholic priest. And Terry and I just looked at each other and, uh, you know, a little bit of shock here. This is 1982. It's not all out now like we have it in various movies and books and, and you know, hundreds, if not thousands of articles. So 1982, a Roman Catholic priest doing something like this even took the two of us by surprise. But now we knew our job was even more cut out. Well, and of course, Fitz, there was no issue really with having the children not being believed later because you saw it. You actually witnessed it. You were an eyewitness to the actual sexual assault. So in my mind, that means this case is what we call in my old job a slam dunk, right? Well, um, sure. It's basically an on-view arrest, as I would use vernacular from back in the day, certainly Pennsylvania legal jargon. The police officer actually saw it happen. Uh, but we still, of course, wanted statements from everybody. And um, so both kids independently, reluctantly admitted uh, to what happened and that he was, in fact, a Roman Catholic priest. We allowed them to call their parents, and then the parents were now en route. Now we're like 12.15 in the morning, 12.30. And now uh, Detective Lockman and I said, it's time to talk to Father Hermley. And that's exactly what we did. And uh, we went in there and uh, sat down with him and he told us his name. He didn't lie about his name. But, well, you know, what do you do? Oh, I'm, a, I'm a counselor. Oh, where? And he names the school. And uh, we go on and he's volunteering nothing about being a priest. And then finally, uh, I said, do you go by another name? Do you have a title or anything? And he kind of looks around and he still wouldn't give it up. And finally, it's well, uh, I said, I heard from one of the boys that you're a, a Roman Catholic priest. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I am. And he hesitates. And that's exactly uh, uh, what he wound up admitting to us. And I said, Father Hermley, am I ever going to call you that tonight? And I, I kept using father with great emphasis on it, like as if, yeah, I believed him. But like, how dare you be in this room right now? How dare you do what I saw you do about an hour ago? And, um, and he didn't seem to appreciate that too much. And at that point, Terry and I kind of looked at each other and I said, I'm going to be the bad cop. You can be the good cop. And that's how we proceeded with the rest of our interview. Well, Fitz, I want to back up a little bit for our listeners, because one of the things that we promise is to take them behind police lines and to tell them about how these kinds of cases impact the people who live them, the cops and prosecutors who actually live them. And what I'm wondering is when you first saw a clearly adult man sexually assaulting a boy, how did you restrain yourself from just yanking him out of that car and, well, giving him an old fashioned beatdown? Yeah, and I should emphasize here, uh, and it's probably obvious, but he was not wearing his priestly garb. He was in plain clothes, so to speak. And um, yeah, and this wouldn't have been the first time in my career that I came upon, um, not so much on site or on view like this, but I was certainly aware of three and four-year-old children being sexually abused, and here comes the father or the mother's boyfriend, and he's the prime suspect. And as much as you want to jump across the desk and just throttle them, no, you maintain your professionalism because that's the way you get them to admit to what they did. And you almost, I don't physically handhold the guy's hands, but almost verbally uh, in, in any kind of an interrogation in that regard, you sort of walk the person through and let them know you're a little bit supportive. And, you know, look, people have problems, these things occur, whatever. And I've had a very good success rate of guys actually coming out and admitting it. But despite what you want to do to them, Francie, uh, you really can't. You got to keep it within the confines of the law. And I find in the long run that works and that gets the justice to these people that they deserve. Well, Fitz, you know, it's interesting that you say that. I mean, in my life as a prosecutor, of course, I sat across the table and across the courtroom from hundreds and hundreds of child sex offenders. And particularly in the courtroom when they were in trial and I had the opportunity to stand up and cross-examine them, that moment, I think, was hard to not absolutely release that passionate rage that I always felt for those who would sexually abuse a child. But like you say, you can't do that. You've got to do your job. And I think that's one of the things that um, is the hardest thing and that I personally found the hardest thing when it came especially to child sexual abuse or child homicide cases, and that is restraining what I always felt was my natural instinct to want to throttle, to use your words, the person sitting in the dock because they had done such horrible things. So I'm interested in whether or not you were able to push down your natural feelings and get the father to confess. Well, um, again, I didn't throttle or thrash in whatever uh, uh, synonym you want to use here, but I was that bad cop. And, and, and Detective Lockman and I had done this before in a case or two, uh, never with a Roman Catholic priest sitting across from us. And I did start banging on the desk and, uh, and I did start telling him he's freaking lying to me, not using those exact words uh, to your audience, uh, you know, that he hadn't said a truthful damn word since we first sat down with him, since we first confronted him, since I first confronted him in the parking lot that night. And, uh, and he was getting a little shaken looking at me standing up and pounding my uh, fist on the desk. Uh, of course, I never touched him. I wouldn't, that's not my style. And next thing you know, um, you know, and Terry kind of calms him down. Uh, a little bit and tries to calm me down. Of course, we're all kind of just playing off of each other here in a perfect way. And then next thing you know, um, I thought, let me go the religious route. And I said to him um, in more calm voice, I said, uh, Father Hermley, are you familiar with the Ten Commandments? And he said, uh, sure I am, yes. 
I said, hey, how many commandments do you think maybe you broke just to say since, you know, six o'clock this evening? And he sits back and thinks, kind of scratches his chin a little bit. Well, I, I think I ran a red light earlier today and I slammed my fist down on the table again. You know that's not what the hell I'm talking about here. You're lying to me again, whether you ran the red light or not. And we went back and forth there. And um, I'm pretty sure the stone tablets from Moses said nothing about running red lights. I, I don't think so either. And they would have crumbled in his presence if, uh, if, they, uh, you know, if the Ark of the Covenant happened to be outside there. Uh, but it didn't quite work that way. So we're going back and forth. And finally, um, I, I just told him, I said, I don't know what your experience is in these types of cases, Father, always emphasizing that. I, I witnessed you going down on that, you know, young boy. And the other kid told me you did it earlier with him. And he just kind of sat back in his seat. He was sweating at this point. And he just kind of came something out with, uh, he finally, the best he would give us that night is I have a problem with young boys. And in so many words, that's what he told us. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sexually attracted to them. But that's all I should probably say. And that's all that he really said that night in terms of any sort of admission, confession, whatever. Well, that's good enough for me for a confession. So you've got two boys who've told you what's been going on. You are yourself are an independent, um, neutral eyewitness. He's given what I consider to be a great admission. What happened in the case? Well, um, the boys' parents came. They knew this priest. And they were actually arguing with me and Detective Lockman in the lobby. That you can't tell me, Father Hermley. We've known him for you know two years now. He's, he's uh, you know the, the assistant pastor at our school. And he takes the boys on trips. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh talk to your son and both kids kind of pull their parents aside. We allow them and they whisper in their ears and the one mother starts crying. The other father slams his fist into the wall. Of course, the priest is back in the, you know, the, the back room at this point, no one out of sight. And, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, Sergeant Fitzgerald. I, I, I just can't believe that he would do something like this. And I said, look, we're going to take it to the courts. I said, I'm going to tell you this young men, your names will not be, uh, you know, we're not going to tell your names to anybody. No newspaper is going to get your name. We, you may have to testify in court. Uh, you know, it, it may have to go in some direction like that. And uh, okay, okay. And they were very thankful that their names wouldn't go public because, of course, they're sex, sexual assault victims and they're also juveniles. So, of course, it would never be released, uh, the names. And um, so they go home. Uh, we arraigned the priest. He had, I think, a $10,000, $20,000 bail, like at you know, 5 a.m. that morning in front of the district magistrate. But I found out he was bailed out by about uh, 10 o'clock that morning by the Roman Catholic Church, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And, um, and after that, uh, I sort of lost control of the case. Um, there was no preliminary hearing. They decided they didn't uh, want to go through the public, um, um, uh, you know, uh, hearing 10 days later in Pennsylvania, uh, in which the prima facie case would have to be established. So they, um, well, they could have taken it directly to indictment to the grand jury instead, right? They just didn't want a public hearing with those children potentially, although they wouldn't have had to testify. You were there, you saw it. And we realized that. And I, I discussed it with the assistant district attorney the next day, you know, how we would prepare for this actually over the next week, detective Lockman was involved, but it so happens they, uh, they passed on doing the preliminary hearing. And about uh, six months or eight months later, uh, I think there was some sort of, uh, of a plea agreement, and he wound up uh, just pleading guilty to some kind of a misdemeanor, indecent assault. And, and the church assured the, the district attorney's office, and indirectly me and Detective Lockman, that you know, he would be uh, handled accordingly and, uh, and receive the proper you know, therapy and things like that. And that's, I had no say in the case, no say in the outcome. The kids weren't contacted or their parents about what do they want to see happening, just virtually uh, a slap on the wrist to Father Hermley. And he was allowed actually to practice as a priest in other schools and other parts of the Northeast and uh, even be associated with kids again. Although I have no, oh, I have no proof that uh, I have no proof that he's ever violated or sexually assaulted any other young boys. I am just horrified. I'm horrified. And I, I find it very hard to believe that even considering he admitted to you that he had a quote problem and was sexually attracted to boys, I find it impossible to believe that he did not sexually assault other boys in his life, especially when he was not even punished for it. I I'm just horrified that he didn't pay for his crime. He didn't go to prison. I don't know, you know what went on with the plea bargain, but that, back in the early 80s, unfortunately, I was not practicing law then yet. I was, uh, I was well, I was a baby. Yeah, I'm going to stick with that story. Oh, okay. I was, I was not practicing law then. And unfortunately, even into the 90s, child sexual abuse wasn't treated with the gravity that it deserved by law enforcement, sometimes by the police, sometimes by the prosecutors, sadly, sometimes by both. And... The parents' reaction in the police station, their absolute refusal or reluctance at minimum to believe the priest could have done it is such a great example of community grooming that Jim talks about all the time. And I just, I understand why this must be, if not the worst, one of your worst cases, because I just don't feel like justice was done. Well, Francie, two more quick follow-ups. Um, the next morning I come back into work and I call the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. I don't even know who to ask for. Uh, the Cardinal's office, but I somehow got put in touch with the legal office and um, whether an attorney or some you know, a paralegal that works in the office. Uh, this is Sergeant Fitzgerald, Ben Salem Police. Yes, I wanted you to know uh, I arrested a father, Robert Hermley, last evening for sexually assaulting two young boys. Okay, thank you. 
Well, do you want any more information? No, that's all we need. Thank you. That's it? That was their response? Never heard from the archdiocese again. And of course, they wound up, I'm sure the priest already called from his, his uh, detention center. And of course, he was bailed out within, like I said, hours of his, uh, of his arraignment and his uh, you know, being taken off the Bucks County prison. So uh, that's that part. And then flash ahead now, uh, if I can, to the year 2005. I'm a profiler uh, at the Quantico, the FBI Academy. And, um, and Jim Clemente may have been involved in this, if not directly, indirectly, because he was a profiler there too. I knew in advance that the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office was coming to Quantico, two of their prosecutors, because they were about to uh, investigate the entire Archdiocese of Philly and for all the uh, alleged wrongdoings over the years of various priests. So I was invited, and quite frankly, I didn't even think to the Hermley arrest. I didn't even. It didn't, I said, oh, I'll show up and I'll help out. And I'm not an expert in you know child molestation, sexualization, but I'm certainly a profiler and I can go there. And uh, so I, I devoted a whole day to it. But then, very beginning of the day, the prosecutors start reading over a few of their early cases. Yeah, we have you know this priest, this priest, this priest. Let me see a Father Robert Hermley. He was arrested in Ben Salem in '82. Then we have this priest. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Can you guys go back a little bit? Oh, sure. Uh, what's that? Hermley, Ben Salem. That was like June of 82. Yes. Um, who's there as the arresting officer? They flip a page. Sergeant James Fitzgerald. I said, yeah, that was me. This is that 23 years later, we're now revisiting this case. And, and they actually told me, you know, Agent Fitzgerald, now Agent Fitzgerald, this was one of the cases when we started reviewing these that stuck out from all the others because it was an on-view arrest made by Sergeant, oh, you, Agent Fitzgerald. And, uh, and, and, and this was the one we couldn't believe that was allowed to be you know, pl plea bargained down to almost nothing, a slap on the wrist. And uh, so you're the, you're the officer who made the arrest. Well, thank you for being here today. And I walked, I walked them through the case again. And of course, the two dozen other cases that they were uh, dealing with at the time. So it's interesting how 23 years later, in a whole different jurisdiction or venue, uh, I revisited the uh, Father Robert Hermley case. And, uh, and we helped uh, you know, close up some other cases with the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Jim, you know, obviously, um, it was an unfortunate set of circumstances, but I was out recovering from a bone marrow transplant when, when the Philly uh, DA came in to the BAU. So I did not have an opportunity to participate in that conversation. I wish I could have, because I'm, I'm sure I would have had a lot of choice words to share. But the fact is that this is a longstanding practice. Um, in fact, the priest at my high school that I went and disclosed to when I got victimized, um, who I later found out was already also victimizing kids, boys in my class and previous classes and subsequent classes, they are just now 40 two or 43 years later, the Catholic Church is just now actually, um, you know, offering to settle cases against um, the church from these victims. And it's just, uh, it's just, it's just outrageous that it has happened. It's outrageous that it was covered up for so long. It's outrageous that victims were made to feel like they were the, the bad people, the guilty ones, and they were totally unprotected by the church. But I do applaud your attempts to at least hold this guy accountable. It's just sad that he wasn't held accountable Im immediately. And, you know, in all likelihood, he he may have molested other people, other kids, um, after he was caught because he wasn't dealt with uh, properly and those victims never got justice. So true, Jim, so true. All right, well, Fitz, uh, I'm so glad that you were able to come and share your story with us. I know it's a sad and disturbing tale, um, and I'm sure that the reason why you picked it out was because of how little justice was done and how this fact hurt you and, and stays and remains with you after all these years. So. I understand it, and um, I think our listeners probably share your frustrations with this. Um, again, we're not condemning the Catholic Church. We're condemning a practice that, that occurred and, and hopefully is not occurring anymore because this is absolutely not how any church, not how any organization that's a youth-serving organization should ever function, and I hope that people have learned their lessons and they will never do this kind of thing again. I agree, Jim, and um, I've met some decent priests over the years, and there's plenty of them out there, but you're right. There was an undercurrent of, uh, of this sort of activity and protected at the levels at the very top of the church, and I'm, I'm hoping those days are behind us. I hope, and I'll even say I pray they're behind us. Okay, well, thank you, Fitz, and thank you, Francie, and for now, signing off for Best Case, Worst Case. Best Case, Worst Case is an XG production produced by Jim Clemente at Empire Studios, L.A., Engineered and edited by Terrell Parham. Music by Simba Sumba. And hosted by Wonder. You can subscribe to Best Case, Worst Case on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, or your favorite listening app.